What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back yike, to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. We're doing a little monkey knife fight action. We haven't done it in a minute. For those y'all that are new to the channel or new to monkey knife fight, this is the number one place to do some player prop games and bring home la revenue. How do you say revenue in Spanish? Revenue. Revenue. We're going to go with Raven. That's like French. Anyways, they have tons of games to play. On monkeyknifefight.com. If you happen to be a basketball head, right? We only do football here at the HQ. But a lot of you play a lot of different fantasy sports. So they just opened up basketball, which just started the NBA season, obviously. So if you're good with player props in terms of basketball, they have basketball, but we're doing football. You hit the little football icon on the top there, and it will bring you to La Football page. And what we want to do is attack some of the games in which we see weaknesses or deficiencies. Now, here is what I love to see. I love to see my man Ryan Tannehill going off last week, taking the place of Mariota. You know, the Titans are rallying around him. You know, they're feeling good about where they're at with their quarterback situation. They're pulling together a couple W's right now. And Tannehill is obviously an increase in the passing game in respect to where Mariota was. Now, the Bucks, on the other, uh, other hand, have a very, very, very large gap funnel defense, meaning they are elite against the run, but they are horrible against thy pass, which means we can take advantage of that because the Titans want to run the ball, but they're going to have to give that up if they want to score the points that the Buccaneers are probably going to at least try to score, probably won't even end up scoring. Sorry, I forgot my mic was all the way over there. Hopefully y'all were able to hear me. Anywho... The Titans will have to throw the ball a lot, and we love to see them running a ton of two tight end sets, which means it's basically a funnel offense as well in the passing game to their two star wide receivers in A.J. Brown and Corey Davis. We like both of those guys, so we're going to mess around and look what kind of challenges they have, and they have all the NFL games, so if you think you see a mismatch on the defense or offense or certain players uh, and those side of things, then click on that game. But I like Tampa Bay. I like Tennessee. And they give you a ton of different options to choose from on monkeyknifefight.com. If you head to monkeyknifefight.com and you use the promo code BDGE when you sign up, you can trail my picks. You could fade my picks. I'm just one man. I'm a one man band over here just throwing out fucking revenue getters. That's what we call my dub picks. The revenue getters. You could, you could trail those and you're going to win some money. You're going to be able to pay the mortgage after this. Use promo code BDGE, and they will give you a 100% deposit match up to $50. So if you throw in 20, you'll get 20 to play with. You'll have $40, and then you could really, 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 really bring home Zek clean. So we're going to check out some of the games they have. Some of them are fantasy point related. Some of them are just statistical related. So with the over-under, you see the different options up top here. It says 2 of 2, which means you have to get both correct. So you have Jameis Winston over 280.5 passing yards. Ryan Tannehill, 253.5. So you, you choose either over or under for each of those, and you have to get 2 of 2. For the next one is 3 of 3. But obviously, the more you have to get correct, the bigger the prize pool is. So you see 5x here. If you throw 10 bucks, you're going to win 50 if you get it right. So these are fun, right? It says like uh, Jameis Winston or Ryan Tannehill, who has more passing yards, but Tannehill is getting plus 26 and a half. For those of y'all that are not gamblers, what that means is at the end of the game, you look at the statistics and depending on who you picked, if you chose Ryan Tannehill, well, it doesn't matter who you chose, but you look at Ryan Tannehill's passing numbers, you throw 26 and a half extra yards on top of whatever he finished with. And then if he passed Jameis Winston's number after the addition of the 26 and a half, that means you won, assuming you picked Tannehill. If you choose Jameis Winston, then that means he has to have had 27 more passing yards or greater than Tannehill, and you would have won that bet. So I'm not in love with any of these players in particular. I want to find a game in which I can kind of utilize Corey Davis and A.J. Brown, maybe even Jonah Smith if they have it in here, um, because I don't feel great about Jameis Winston and his passing. Like I do think he'll probably go over around 280 passing yards, but the Tennessee defense is obviously a little tougher than most people uh, give them credit for. I also, the Godwin, Mike Evans thing, like obviously Godwin's having a better year, but it seems still like a coin flip on a week to week basis. Like Mike Evans can go off for, you know, seven, 175 and two touchdowns any given week. Obviously Godwin's been more consistent doing that, but I don't, I think it's more of a coin flip that way. Uh, Derek Henry, Ronald Jones. I think Henry will really struggle on the ground in this one uh, because the Tampa Bay run defense is really, 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 really good. 
But on the flip side, like I don't trust Ronald Jones to go for more than you know 25 yards on the ground. Who knows? Coming off the bye, they might just start Peyton Barber, give him the first five carries, and all of them end up with like eight carries at the end of the game. So I kind of want to stay away from all those guys. So we can do the touchdown dance. We can do these fantasy challenges. And basically the fantasy challenge, what we want to do is hit 49 and a half, 54 and a half, 61 and a half. You get to choose depending on how much prize money you want to win. And the players have to add up. You can pick any players you want in this game to add up to hit those numbers. Um, this is full PPR. You can see the scoring settings by hitting the info here. Sorry, I didn't actually like look at what games I really, 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 really like before doing this, which I probably should have to give you guys um, a little bit more juice. So reception collection. I like this. I like that. Um, so this is an interesting one because we're just going with straight reception. So you can hit 16 and a half, 17 and a half, 20 and a half. Uh, we're going to go with Chris Godwin and we're going to go with the two Tennessee receivers. I should probably go with Mike Evans. Actually, we'll go with two Tampa Bay receivers because as much as I like Brown and Corey Davis, uh, if you look at what the pass attempt numbers are probably going to be, it's going to favor Jameis. I think so far this year, let's, uh, let's actually, you know, let's do some search. Jameis Winston, FF Today. OJ Howard dealing with a hamstring injury, so that might mean more targets funneled to the wide receivers again. So if you look at Winston, 36, 25, 37, 41, 27, 54. So the majority of the time he's at over 35 pass attempts. When you when you look at the Tennessee offense, the majority of the time they're around 25 to 30. So just pure statistics and using pure common sense, the Tampa Bay offense will probably end up passing the ball more. And I, I feel like one of these guys, either Evans or Godwins, end up with about eight receptions at the end of the game, one of the two. So the other one just needs to put up like four or five, and then we just need to get some receptions from the Titans. Now, this will be an interesting debate. Corey Davis versus A.J. Brown. Now, Brown actually led the team in, in targets last week with eight of them, but Davis came in with the bigger fantasy day because he got in the end zone. I like Brown. Um, he is my favorite of the two. So we're going to go Godwin, Mike Evans, A.J. Brown for reception collection. They need to combine to go over 16 and a half. So they need 17. If you want to go two extra prize, you can go 17 and a half. So they'd have to hit 18, three extra prize. Or if you go 20 and a half, five extra prize. So I'd probably go with the lowest one just to feel a little bit safer. Ah, fuck it. We're going to go 17 and a half, three extra prize, throw down 10 bucks. You're going to win 30 plus your 10 back, of course. So we need 18 receptions combined between Godwin, Evans, AJ Brown. Let's lock it down. MonkeyKnifeBite.com promo code BDGE will get you 100% deposit match. You can go look at all the games. There's a lot of fun ones to play on here, y'all. So go over there, support me as a creator. I love you. Let's win some money. And let's head over to the DFS section of today's video. All right, y'all. Welcome to the DFS portion of today's video. As always, we are joined with Mr. Joe Holka. And we're going to break down position by position our favorite plays for DraftKings uh, this week. What's going on, Joe? I know you had a, an entertaining night last night. You, you threw a little money down on Thursday Night Football. You happen to be at the game. Your girlfriend is a cheerleader for the Vikings, which I just learned last night. Last night's conversation was, was pretty fun. I like uh, 12 beer deep Joe a little bit. Yeah, I uh, went to the game last night, had some showdown going, basically break even, which uh, feels like a win after uh, kind of what transpired in that game. But yeah, man, I don't talk about uh, my girl a ton. Comes off as kind of douchey, but uh, yeah, she's, she's uh, not as cool as you think, trust me. <laughs> okay, we'll take your word for it, I guess. I also want to go on the record and say that this stuff, LaCroix or whatever, the stuff that's been very popular, is terrible. I hate sparkling water, seltzer, whatever you would consider this. Um, so do not judge me for having this. I just, I have a, a knack to be drinking something during all of my videos. I need to have something in hand, which I usually, as I mentioned to you before, get yelled at. So please don't <laughs> yell at us for drinking. He obviously needs to stay hydrated after uh, last I need night. The, I need the coffee right now. I need it bad. Yeah, that's like an extra, extra, extra large. It's That's pretty much me every morning. I respect yeah, that. Pretty much. Right. You ready to talk quarterbacks? Let's do it, man. Yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting week at quarterback. Like, I'm sure most of you guys have been kind of following along throughout the year, and um, I put a lot of emphasis on just trying to target these guys that do have a, a little bit of a, a rushing floor. Um, we talked about Josh Allen last week. Probably got um, a little bit bailed out with John Brown and just not getting a ton of targets there, but he did get deep for one, which was good. Um, but Josh Allen didn't throw a ton of passes in that game. That's, that's always the concern with those larger spread situations as well. Uh, this week against Philly, um, it is going to be a little bit tighter. I think that it could be back and forth a little bit. So I think Josh Allen 
is back in play for sure. Um, kind of at the top, the guy that I'm looking at, though, is just going all the way up to Sean Watson against Oakland. Um, we saw what Green Bay just did against this team, but uh, we also know that it's a team that can be beat deep. So I'm sure we'll talk about Kenny Stills in a bit, uh, no Will Fuller, uh, but I still think Deshaun Watson uh, is squarely in play. Against Oakland, um, really every metric that I'm looking at it is kind of just uh, popping as a, a green type of scenario for, for Deshaun Watson. I think, so I think he's in a great spot. Um, if you did want to kind of pivot in that same price range all the way up top, I think Russell Wilson, again, back on top of uh, kind of my model here for a lot of the same reasons as Deshaun Watson. I do think there's a little bit more um, kind of risk involved with Russell Wilson in almost any slate just because they could go run heavy at any moment uh, with Chris Carson. Obviously, we know Atlanta has been a team that can be beat uh, pretty much wherever you want. Uh, but I do like that game for plays and pace. So if you're paying all the way up, I think those are interesting. Uh, the guy I kind of want to get your take on, though, is Ryan Tannehill. So on DraftKings in particular, he's at 5,100. Uh, we know this Tampa Bay team um, funnels towards the pass consistently. Uh, Tannehill should give us a little bit on the ground as well. I, I mean, I don't love kind of the um, the outside metrics for Tannehill. I don't think he's super talented. Yards per attempt, that sort of stuff uh, doesn't look great. Um, so what, what do you think about Tannehill this week against Tampa Bay? Yeah, when I started looking at the quarterback position, I was I was interested to hear your take because there are guys at every level of the pricing section that I think fit in the lineup. And yep. you know, normally you're not a guy that pays up for quarterback, but when you have two mobile quarterbacks that aren't crazy, crazy expensive, expensive with Russ and uh, Deshaun mobile going against two really, really, really weak defenses that are better against the run than they are against the pass. It opens up a lot for them. So they actually might be worth the investment on them. And, you know, I'm looking at Kyler in the middle. I even like Stafford in the middle coming off his big game. No carry on Johnson. You might have to throw yep. the ball a little bit more. And then I get down to the bottom section and I see Ryan Tannehill at 5,100. And uh, I'm, I'm a fan of him this week. I think that, um, I, I'm not going to go crazy because we all know what Tannehill is. He, he is Marcus Mariota in a sense. That's coming off a big week, one of his better passing performances. But he gives you a much high, higher ceiling, in my opinion, than Mariota. And a, and a better passing floor, I think. Because there are so many games that Mariota finishes with like, I don't know, 130, 170 passing yards. Where I think in this game, you kind of said it perfectly, they'll be going against Tampa Bay which is absolutely a funnel defense, right? They're, they're a team that's very, very, very good against the run, but horrible against the pass. So you know Tennessee's a team where all they want to do is run the ball. My, my concern is that they're going to continue to do that because we've had plenty of games where Derrick Henry has gone 17 for 45 or whatever. So it tells you they're not going to be shifting away. But I do think just hearing all the players from Tennessee's locker room, they're like, you know, we felt a different air of confidence. We felt like we were going to go out there, score points, and win this game. I think that, like, we, we saw a really quick connection between him, A.J. Brown, Corey Davis. Um, and this is going to be a situation where they're not going to wait. I know they don't throw the ball very often. And even last game, he didn't get over 30 pass attempts, I don't think. Um, like, I, I think because of the way their offense runs, they do a lot of two tight end sets. I think they're the most heavy team in the NFL in terms of two tight end sets. So that kind of forces him to throw to his best weapons, not dumping it off to Adam Humphreys all the time. So it's going to go to A.J. Brown. It's going to go to Corey Davis, which I think in maybe it's a little bit of a reach, but it would make his attempts a little bit more uh, efficient on the outside. And it's going to be a game where they're going to have to throw the ball. So, yeah, I, I actually really like Tannehill, and I think I have him as maybe my quarterback 12 this week in my, uh, my season-long ranking. So I, don't, I definitely don't think he's out of the question, but I do think obviously there's a, a little bit of recency bias kind of mixed in there. Yeah, I think we've been kind of like this year, we, we've been kind of spoiled by paying up for some of these guys that have been getting there. But typically on DraftKings, it is a position where you do want to historically kind of pay down and, and pay up at other positions. We haven't had um, as much, I feel like, to pay up for at certain positions the last couple of weeks. So it, it made sense to get up to some of these guys in the mid 6K range. So uh, I think Tannehill will draw some ownership, especially in cash games. One thing that I do like quite a bit, um, I'm almost always looking at quarterbacks that some of them do really well under pressure, right? Like someone like Deshaun Watson has historically done really well while under pressure. Tannehill is the complete opposite. He, as far as his yards per attempt, um, pretty pathetic um, when he is under pressure. Um, so that's a concern with this Tennessee offensive line. But Tampa Bay is not a team that really pressures a ton anyway. They're in the bottom third of adjusted sack rate. Um, so I'm not that worried about that this week in particular. I think that's something that um, if Tannehill does end up getting chalky and maybe we have a situation where he's playing against the team um, that does pressure that would be a situation where I wouldn't want to go there but yeah I'm interested I think the weapons are definitely um, cheap enough to make it work um, and I think that the pass percentage I mean at least over the last three games or so just Tennessee's kind of middle of the pack so there's a lot of teams out there that are running 
uh, at least a little bit more in the short term. So uh, a team that, I mean, typically, uh, and Tampa Bay, it is a funnel defense, but they've been a lot worse against the deep pass, which is something Tannehill hasn't done a ton of, um, at least over the last uh, year sample that we have of him. So I think it's fine at the price. If he was like even 5,500, I think I'd be taking a second look um, and just trying to find another option though. So I don't love it, but I think the price makes it worth in, uh, in, in GPPs. Yeah, I'm definitely looking to – I mean, there are a lot of good options. We'll get to wide receiver and even tight end in a little bit. But I think if you're going to roll with Tannehill, um, I, I think the move would probably be stacking him with one of his weapons on the outside, If you're, especially if you're playing in like a tournament. But it gets a little tricky because you could probably go one of three ways between Brown, Corey Davis, Jonu Smith, even if mm. Walker is out. So we'll get to that in a sec. Running back's a very interesting um, position this week because normally, you know, we just say take the guys who we know are going to get the workload – who are going to put up the points, whatnot. So we have Dalvin Cook, who would have been the chalk play, of course, against Washington had he not played on Thursday night. But in the main slate, we have Christian McCaffrey, who's at 9,200, the most expensive player on the slate by far. But he's got this matchup against San Francisco, who's been a shutdown defense. It's like, you know, an immovable object, whatever that fucking saying is, you know how that works. That's what the Christian McCaffrey versus San Francisco is. And we saw him struggle against Tampa Bay uh, multiple times. He couldn't get much going on the ground. But he's Christian McCaffrey, so you know he's still getting those seven to eight targets. And, you know, you have, you have Barkley right behind him at 8,900, who is the second most expensive guy. But there, there just seems to be – I don't know what it is. They're not doing a good job of scheming him uh, in space when it comes to targets and reception. So Barkley's getting the workload. You know, he's getting the 20-plus touches, but he's not turning in those 180-yard games or that, you know, that ceiling that a guy like Christian McCaffrey has – so there's something off there in the Giants offense in which we're not seeing the outcome from Barkley. So it makes me a little bit hesitant to throw him in there, even though this Detroit team is uh, supposedly they're like really pissed off about the Quandre Diggs trade. And I think this defense is a little bit deflated overall um, with carry on getting hurt and everything. So they're on kind of a down downward slope. So I could see this being a big bounce back game for Barkley. And the other news, of course, is, you know, what's going to happen with David Johnson here. Um, Chase Edmonds would be a smash play, but he's also going against the Saints in New Orleans. And that's a really, really tough run defense. So are we confident enough to actually throw him right into our lineups? Seems like maybe it's something that you would have to do just because he's 6,200 and he's going to get, you know, 20 touches. And we've seen what he could already do with that type of workload. So where is your head at when it comes to running backs this week? I actually think running backs really hard this week. So that, like you said, like we have these guys like Christian McCaffrey, like even if you want to throw Saquon in there, like at the top, like normally we have a lot more safety with those guys this week. It's, it's tougher. Like I definitely think that Christian McCaffrey is someone that I'm still going to consider um, despite the matchup. I do think that that's something that I'm trying to get better at is just looking past um, some of these spots for really volume dependent positions like running back. So at 9,200, yeah, it, it's, it's going to depend on what we can do. To get there I think the Alvin Kamara thing is going to really shape the slate as well because if Kamara doesn't play um, I think Latavius Murray's basically a lock um, so I think that he's someone that um, last week I think if I made one mistake last week I ended up going Chris Carson over Latavius even though I had Latavius projected for basically the same amount of touches and very similar usage through the air as well um, so I think that that was kind of a mistake I think that Latavius like regardless of what I think of him as a player um, this New Orleans uh, scheme is is going to always favor these pass catching backs. I, I think that um, I hope we get clarity on Kamara because if we don't, that's going to be an interesting situation. Because if Kamara was completely healthy, he'd be the biggest lock on the slate at 7,600 against the Cardinals. Um, so Cardinals, a team 31st at defending running backs in the passing game. Like it's an amazing spot for whoever New Orleans back it is. If we do get clarity, if we don't, probably GPP only. Um, I, I, I'm interested. Yeah, like what you said about Saquon. It's tough because, like, I, I still have, like, this this picture of, like, how his usage was and them kind of getting him more involved. And I, I'm questioning his ceiling, which is, I guess, scary to say, which means he's probably going to score three touchdowns and everyone listening to this should play him. Uh, but I'm questioning that price based on, like, if we project him for 20-some touches, there's tons of backs on the slate we can project for very similar touch counts for a lot cheaper. So um, a couple of the guys that I'm looking at in the mid-range, again, Chris Carson, 7K, I think he's – Still very much underpriced against Atlanta, um, a team that just struggles defensively in general. They're pretty good against the run, but they really struggle against uh, – I think they've actually done better against the run just because the sample's so small because everyone's just been throwing against them. Um, so if they get out ahead, I think that Carson's at 7K is really interesting. Um, there's two price pivots that um, are kind of in that same range, though, like Le'Veon Bell, 6,900. No one wants to play any of these Jets. 
Um, but he's still someone that we can project for 24 touches, probably four catches at least. I don't think there's a huge ceiling there from Le'Veon, but we were all falling over ourselves to play this guy a couple weeks ago when he was 6,500. His usage hasn't changed. It's Jacksonville. They can be beat on the ground 27th in DVOA to running back. So yep. I think Le'Veon is in play. Um, so those are kind of the guys that, that I'm looking at. Um, Ty Johnson at 4,900 is going to draw some ownership for sure. Um, I'm not as interested in that as most people. Um, I think that the fact that they do have some other backs on the roster, it, Ty Johnson someone that catches passes. I get all of that. He's 4,900. Great. Um, I question ceiling with him. Uh, it's a great matchup against the Giants. And like I said, I think he'll be popular. But um, I think if he ends up getting like 15 touches, you're going to feel um, like you wish you would got a little bit more. And since there is so many good running back plays on this slate, I'm struggling a little bit with Ty Johnson. So uh, kind of covered a lot there, but uh, what, what are you thinking so far at the position? Uh, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think – I know this is very contrary to what, you know, your normal strategy would be, but I actually really like Austin Eckler this week. Uh, I, I think it's because, one, people you – know, Chicago's defense uh, against the run as well, especially without a key mix, um, has not been that stellar. Obviously, Eckler's not the guy who's going to be running it up the middle too much, but – Keenan Allen is the big, like, wild, wild card here because he injured his hamstring, I believe it was yesterday, maybe two days ago. Hasn't practiced since. If Keenan Allen's out, this seems like a spot where they're going to need to use Eckler in the slot a lot, and we've already seen how much damage he could do through the air. He's on pace for, like, 1,100 receiving yards and 110 receptions. Obviously, that's loaded a little bit by his early season production without Melvin Gordon, but we've seen him have a few monster receiving games with Melvin Gordon back there. I, I, they, I just can't imagine them continuing to pound Melvin Gordon up the middle. They just lost Forrest Lamp as well. It just seems like a spot where they're going to need to use Eckler, whether it's out of the backfield, whether it's in the slot, if Keenan Allen misses time. So I know we always want to go with volume when it comes to the running back position because we have the luxury of choosing guys in which we know are going to get those workloads. But I'm, I'm kind of a fan of Eckler this week as maybe a little bit of a pivot play because I think he's in for – uh, a really big receiving workload. What are you? What are your thoughts on Eckler? Yeah, so I think he's he's in play for GBPs for all the reasons that you stated. I, I would prefer that like, you get this on a lot of slates. You get these Chargers uh, in the afternoon, and he makes an amazing pivot at that point if your team's behind. But he is in the one o'clock game this week. Um, but I'm with you. I think that if you're playing large field stuff, he makes a lot of sense. Um, I, and by the way, like I know a lot of your audience is season long. Like the kind of the one thing that I've done um, over the last few years, kind of. Uh, towards the the season long crowd is my rushing expectation running back methodology and one guy that historically just hates is Melvin Gordon and people like to just bury me for that but we talk about how important volume is like I, I re realistically don't think that Melvin Gordon's very good at football I haven't thought that for like three years um, so I love Austin Eckler in a complete different like same scenario like kind of what the methodology does is it looks at um, how these running backs should be doing relative to how good or how poor their offensive line is. It is some efficiency baked into there, but it's, it's a sample of over 10 years of data. Um, and Austin Eckler does pr very well in comparison to Melvin Gordon in a pretty similar situation. So um, I've always been a fan of Eckler. I, I think in, um, in GPPs, he makes sense. I, I think that he's a little bit of a tougher sell for me um, in anything smaller field. But yeah, I think you'll get him at super low ownership. And especially if, if Keenan's out, like you said, like he soaks up some of those targets you might get there with touches um, to make uh, kind of that salary worth it in tournaments. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I've never loved – this was the first year I've ever drafted Melvin Gordon. Uh, I got him, like, right before the season kicked off, so we knew he was holding out, and I got him in, like, the 10th round in mm -hmm. one league in which I already had Eckler. So I figured, you know, Eckler's going to be in there, do really well for the beginning of the, week, uh, beginning of the year. As soon as Eckler uh, – as soon as Gordon comes back, he kind of fills back into his role. The problem is, like you said, he's just not – he's just not been very good at football and it, they're just not opening up lanes for him. And he's not able to, you know, uh, produce missed tackles and it's getting ugly there. So yeah, like I, it's a conundrum in which like, I don't know what to do on a weekly basis because Eckler always has that floor of getting, you know, three carries and five targets. And, you know, at, at, if he doesn't get in the end zone, he might just end up with like 45 yards and that obviously kills your lineup for a guy you're paying um, like $500 less for, than like Le'Veon Bell or Chris Carson or something like that, which is why that completely makes sense. But I do think if I'm making multiple lineups, he's someone that I'm probably going to throw into uh, one or two of them. So let's pivot over to the wide receiver position. Now, I know that you're a big fan of going with the middle 
tier wide receivers, there are a lot of juicy matchups, right? Like if we're paying up for those quarterbacks on the flip side, each of those quarterbacks has uh, receivers in which we want to hammer down home. We have DeAndre Hopkins, who's 8,100, which is obviously very expensive for uh, a wide receiver. I'm not sure we really want to play that. Uh, and then we have the Rams going up against the Cincinnati Bengals, which, you know, on paper seems like someone should have a big game there. Maybe we're a little bit down on cup because he hasn't really produced last week or whatever. Um, but, you know, the matchup is there, but the Bengals are down like most of their main cornerbacks right now. But it's it just so hard to trust Jared Goff and, um, and those Rams receivers at this point, because, at, you know, every, every week it just seems like they're going five for 70 or whatever. And that's also not what you want in your lineup if you're paying up, but it seems like there are a lot of other good plays. Like you mentioned, Kenny Stills as a uh, wide receiver two there now with Will Fuller out. Um, I think that like John Brown uh, pairing up with Josh Allen coming off a big week should be another big week against Philadelphia. Uh, who else we have Cortland Sutton now with Emmanuel Sanders gone. What are your thoughts here? Because it seems like there are a lot of like really, really good value plays in the middle of uh, in the middle of the pricing. Yeah, it's a wide receiver again. Like, like you said, I think that like those guys at the top totally in play. Someone like DeAndre Hopkins, like he's finally like getting it going again, right? Like he like he's got twelve targets consecutive games, like twenty nine percent target share. It's like the second highest in the league over that span, just behind Th Thomas. Um, so I think that he's. Super interesting. I think a lot of people just aren't going to play Michael Thomas because of the Patrick Peterson effect. Again, I say this every week. I just don't care as much about wide receiver cornerback matchups as most people. Like, if they're popping and the things that I know matter, like even last week, like Allen Robinson standing out, he's got that tough Lattimore matchup. But, like, he was someone that just was very underpriced relative to his volume. So I, I take shots on those guys, I think, in DFS um, based on the ownership discount you get. So I actually think that um, Michael Thomas is someone that I'm, I'm kind of interested in. But looking at ownership a little bit, um, people are on that. And, and I think that if there's a chance that Peterson doesn't follow him into the slot, Michael Thomas is still super interesting at the top end. And at, at the reason I, I, I brought up ownership is Kenny Stills is projected to be like one of the highest owned wide receivers right now. People are getting sharper, man. Like that wouldn't have happened. I feel like a couple of years ago, these guys with like the high a dot, like, I mean, uh, people are kind of just checking box scores at that point for the longest time. So the edge is changing for sure. Um, so uh, that's interesting. I never thought he was that. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts on? Yeah, he, he was easily like the number one waiver wire pickup this week, assuming yeah. that Chase Edmonds was already owned. I mean, he was number one wide receiver pickup this week, and like everybody yeah. was on him. So you were blowing a pretty decent percentage of fab on him. So I would assume that, you know, everyone playing season long is all over stills for the most part. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, I think he's a great play. We'll, we'll see. Like, I think he's a better, like, he's a better play, obviously, when he's not that highly owned, but um makes a great stack you mentioned Corlin Sutton yeah he's someone that like I've been all over just because of his weighted opportunity rating again it's just one of my favorite metrics it's free airyards.com anyone listening to this um it's it's one of the most valuable things you can use um for wide receiver so 5300 he's one of those ones that like just stands out right away as just to being completely underpriced um this week I still think that Mike Williams is interesting and people are going to bury me for that but uh 4k um relative to his, his target share through the air again if we don't get Keenan Allen um, I, I think that he's still uh, pretty underpriced. He dropped one in the end zone last week. Uh, this team, the Chargers have actually thrown uh, more than any team in the league over the last three games. So 72% of their uh, offensive pass play or offensive plays have been through the air. So I I'm interested in Mike Williams um, against Chicago again. Like I'm not super scared of the matchup by any means. Uh, there, there's a couple other guys too that um, I'm not sure how on they'll be. Like Tyler Boyd, I, I get it. Like it's it's – it's the Rams, uh, potentially Ramsey, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 5,100 for a guy that has just seen crazy volume but hasn't really been doing much with it. He's got 14 targets last week, played almost 100% of the snaps, only had five catches for 50 yards. Like, what are you doing with Tyler Boyd? I would assume he's a frustrating guy in season long too. Yeah, I, sh I actually shipped him out a couple of weeks ago just because, uh, I don't know, it seemed like he was going to be the guy in Cincinnati uh, as soon as A.J. Green was announced to be out for all this time. But it, I, maybe they have better weapons than we're giving them credit for. Like, I think this Auden Tate kid is a good yeah. wide receiver in real life. And you're seeing a lot of, you know, like the thing with Tyler Boyd was last year, he was an explosive down, downfield playmaker as well. Like he was getting targets downfield and, and caught a lot of them. This year, he's getting none of them. Like you're seeing a lot of games where he's getting, you know, 8, 10, 12, like you said, 14 targets, but none of them are past like eight yards. And that's becoming Do you a think he's 
you think he's one of those guys that like needs that alpha? Like he, he's maybe just can't carry his weight as a number one. I've heard a couple people mention that and I'm not really sure if I'm there yet. Cause I, I like Tyler Boyd quite a bit. Um, so I think he's uh, you know, there was a lot of talk the off season with the new head coach coming over, you know, coming over from the Rams or whatever. And that Boyd was going to be used like um, I don't know, like what they say, either, either cup or woods or whatever, but none of those guys really get the downfield shots. Like I would right. like to see Boyd use as a guy who, is moving all over the field like not just a safety guy over the middle so I think Boyd's a very good player I I don't think he needs an alpha in order to succeed I just think he needs to be given the opportunity to run different types of routes the problem with fantasy is like it's not up to us and that's probably you know we already have a half an entire half of the season pretty much as a sample size and that's just not going to happen so they can keep throwing it to him 10 times a game but if the a dot is like five or six yards down the field it's not really going to turn into something. So Boyd has been someone that's not really um, – I had him in one league and I shipped him off. So, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not really looking to, to play him, to be honest. Yeah, I, I talk about weighted opportunity rating a lot, but another thing that I look at, and I know you do too, is uh, yards per route run. Uh, so over the last four games, Boyd's yards per route run 1.3, that, that's pathetic. Um, and, and it's basically a metric that, like, historically has given us, like, some of the – more consistent like some of the best wide receivers in the NFL are almost always popping in that metric it's really sticky um that's a terrible number for for a wide receiver even you also yeah sorry to cut you off but you also mentioned that you know you don't really look at the cornerback wide receiver matchups I do check the the chart that PFF puts up every week just to see who they expect to be shadowed and they actually have Jalen Ramsey shadowing Tyler Boyd this week now they're not always 100% right and I I really don't think that would be the case because Ramsey doesn't really shadow into the slot against those types of guys. But I just think that's uh, interesting to note. So if he gets a lot of Jalen Ramsey, obviously that's uh, a little bit of a downgrade if you're looking for something that maybe is like a tiebreaker between him and you know even DK Metcalf uh, against Atlanta in that same price range. So I think it's another interesting play. seems like yeah. we bring him up like almost every week because they have a lot of good matchups and he can't mm-hmm. produce. But he's leading – the NFL and end zone targets and red zone targets. No Will Disley. We finally saw him get nine targets last game. Um, I'm interested to see if this passing offense is actually going to regress. Obviously, it's a one-game sample size of Russell Wilson kind of not being superhuman. Mm-hmm. But if they actually regress without Will Disley there, because he was like a really, really big part of that offense, and he became a safety valve for them. And I don't know if they had that over-the-middle guy for Russell Wilson to kind of depend on to catch all those balls when he's in trouble. Yeah, I think the best way to kind of quantify, like, he was useful, right? Like, he's something that, like, really helped them, like, uh, like from a real football perspective, like, not even just fantasy. So, like, um, getting Tyler Lockett um, some better looks, I mean, just because they had to kind of respect the middle of the field a little bit more. So, I'm with you, man. I, I don't play Tyler Lockett in DFS just because I'm not going to chase that ceiling game for him. He almost always feels like he's, on like, overpriced to me. Um, so, like, I'm always just going to be the guy that just takes a flyer on on Metcalf if I am going to kind of attack that uh that passing game but I mean it is a great spot um I think that Russ is is super interesting like Russ is one of those guys too that like and and just to kind of circle back to like uh quickly quarterback just because um maybe we didn't talk about Russ enough like he's someone that um yards per attempt like any type of metric like that like he is just smashing and like this this uh, this spot for him is is great um someone too and um I don't typically play these guys but like last week we talked about about Goff and what a great spot it was for Goff. I, I think it's a similar spot for Stafford this week too against the Giants. I, I like Stafford quite a bit. If you do want to go the route of a guy that that doesn't rush a ton, um, like you can pair him with you can pair him with Marvin Jones, fine. But I think people are going to be chasing that uh, that monster game, obviously from Week Seven. Kenny Galladay still stands out to me as like one of the better values, uh, kind of in the mid range. Like th- this team, like. Uh, just Gallaudet in particular, he's still leading the team at targets. His average depth of target is is pretty uh, incredible too, like 14 yards downfield. So I think that um, this Giants defense, like they're they're the fourth worst at allowing completions for passes that are 15 or more yards downfield. So I, I think that actually Stafford has a ton of upside this week. Um, so from like a tournament perspective, like stacking him with with Gallaudet is something that I'm I'm actually really considering if I end up throwing him in some large fields. Yeah, I like that because, I mean, we knew that Marvin Jones was due for one of these games. Like, he'll have one or two of these every single season. Yep. I mean, I think people, like, see these and then they're like, okay, it's Marvin Jones over Kenny Galladay again. But, like, look at the first seven weeks of the season. It was Galladay, and he's going to be the guy still continuing to move forward. So, I like that Galladay call. Let me ask you, going back to Ryan Tannehill and the Titans, 
who do you like more, Davis or A.J. Brown? Just to, first of all, just in like a football sense, because I love A.J. Brown as a prospect. I think, I think he is like on such a good trajectory uh, as long as like they can get a stable quarterback there, uh, as well as like DFS for this week. Yeah, like so I think I have some biases away from Corey Davis just because of how often he was like, kind of popping in, in some of the, like the air yard stuff for like it was, seems like two seasons and he just like never got there like always underperformed relative to like his volume um so I I think if I had to go I mean the ceiling's definitely AJ Brown I think and I don't know if it's really that close um they definitely had a little bit of chemistry there I agree with you that he's uh, a good prospect as well he only played about half the snaps a little over half the snaps last week which I guess is a little bit concerning but still saw eight targets um I mean he's seen uh, at least one uh, red zone target in back-to-back games. So I, I think that um, Tannehill, I mean, if they have some sort of chemistry, I think he's the guy that that people will be on. But um, both of these guys are priced at a spot where I think it still makes a ton of sense. Humphrey's that guy that's just super safe underneath. Those guys aren't as valuable in DFS anymore, to be completely honest. It used to be okay to just, like, play these wide receivers that were 3,500 to 4K just to get savings and just move on with your 10 points. But you're, you're going to get buried in GBPs that way because people are taking more chances and they're taking more chances in, in smarter ways than they ever have. So you got to build an upside. Uh, so I think it's A.J. Brown for me. What do you think? Yeah, I'm with you on A.J. Brown. I just think like, well, first of all, Corey Davis got the touchdown. So that's the only reason why he's even being considered in this duo. Like if that went towards A.J. Brown, he would have probably been the top waiver wire pickup this week along with Kenny Stills. I just, like you said, he played on over maybe 50% of the snaps, but that's been increasing throughout the year. And I think over the last like four weeks, he's been around, um, I didn't realize he was that low last week, but he's been around the 60, 65, 70-ish percent mark. And the fact that he played that few of snaps and still commanded, I believe it was like a 28% target share. It was eight of the 29 uh, pass attempts that 10 held through. So obviously he's there and he's getting a lot of long shots downfield. And I think he will be that go-to guy when Tannehill takes some shots and he will because he's going against the Tampa Bay, um, Tampa Bay defense. So I'm all in on AJ Brown in every form of fantasy football this year. I also like their tight end, Jonu Smith. He's a super, super athletic guy. Had his best game of the season last week, which was not crazy good. It was three for 64, but Delaney Walker came into the game with an ankle issue, ended up leaving really early, which, you know, opened the gates for, Jonah Smith to actually, you know, run a few more routes. This was the first game all season. He's actually played more snaps than Blaney Walker in like four of seven games, I think. But this was the first time he actually ran more routes than Walker did because he left, of course. Uh, But if he's out and he hasn't been practicing at all this week, that opens up a spot where he's going against Tampa Bay, who's allowed the second most fantasy points to the tight end position. So if you're really looking to pay down at tight end, where I don't even know where he is. He's probably at 2,900, I think, the last I looked. Let me look, make sure. I'm scrolling through. I don't see him. But, yeah, I'd imagine he's around the $3,000 mark, if not even lower than that. Um, 2,800, I mean, yeah. 28, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, a few other guys make sense at the tight end position. I don't want any part of Kittle, who's the most expensive, who will probably be checked down by Luke Keekley more often than not. Darren Waller, like, I don't I, – I can't see how you don't get him into your lineup in, in some, some way or another, just given that they have no one else to throw to. And this is going to be a game – where both sides are going to have to throw the ball a ton. Depends on if Tyrell Williams is out. If Tyrell Williams is out again, Darren Waller is going to see another double-digit number of targets. Austin Hooper uh, becomes super interesting now with Mohamed Sanu out of the way, playing against Seattle, who has been super, super, super friendly against the tight end position. Um, And also Hunter Henry. Chicago hasn't been good against the tight end position. And like I said, if Keenan Allen is out, it's going to be Hunter Henry and Austin Eckler getting tons and tons of targets. So, for me, it looks like I'm going to be either paying all the way up for one of those top guys or looking down at, at Jonu Smith. What about you? Yeah, I like Jonu Smith quite a bit. It's a guy that I've played in preseason DFS just because of how like kind of t- talented of an athlete. He's at least a, kind of a spark freak, if I'm remembering correctly. So I think he's right. interesting, especially if you're rolling out Tannehill. Uh, really cheap stack. Uh, gives you access to do a lot of different things through your lineup but yeah man Darren Waller like he, that was my biggest like my kind of most tilting thing of week seven was uh it was a really close call for me between Darren Waller, Waller and Mark Andrews they were like the same price um Andrews just drops on the end zone like has just a terrible game and then Waller Bro, he dropped goes like completely nuts he, he dropped like seven passes last game it did that was so like when I feel like when something's that close and like their projection was basically the same as well and you just make the wrong decision and get just buried on the other side of it there's like not a lot of worse feelings in DFS so uh yeah I mean 
the same reason that Waller was a great play last week. He's a great play this week. Tyrell uh, still seems like he's going to be out. Like the target share there is is just massive. Like he's he's running deeper routes as well. So for a tight end, a little bit more upside um, than some of these other guys. So yeah, I think that he's he's the clear uh, chalk option. I think this week, even at fifty nine hundred. Um, so I'm in on that. Um, another guy, and I want to roll this uh, kind of by you at the cheap end. I agree that I think Jonu is the guy I prefer. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about uh, Dallas Goddard this week because uh, he's all the way down close to min price as well. Um, has had a role in this offense for sure. So what do you think about him all the way down the bottom? Uh, I, I think it's – I'm not on board. I, I Probably think it's, thin. I, yeah, I still think it's getting a little bit too cute. I think people want it to happen more than it's really going to happen. And he scored a couple of touchdowns. But at the same time, it's like if you look at it objectively, are you, do you really want a guy who's playing on 55 or 60 percent of the, the snaps? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we all like the talent and we all like the fact that he's getting a little bit more opportunity. But compared to the other tight ends that you're going to have in your lineup, I just I just think like anytime we get excited about a guy who's really only playing 50 to 60 percent of the snaps, he's just going to let us down. Like that's normal yeah. part of the course. I feel the same way about him because he, he, my first instinct is like, wow, people like are on him kind of out of nowhere a little bit. Um, but then I saw the touchdowns and whatnot. Uh, there's actually a, a couple of guys I feel like that are down there that are in play. Cameron Braid, if, if OJ Howard doesn't play, 2,700. He's Maybe been ruled Tennessee. out. Yeah, he's been ruled out. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's that's an interesting one. Um, all the way down there, he's 2,700. So, like, there's like more options I feel like at tight end to pay down for. So, like, so we don't have, always have weeks like this. Sometimes it's like Noah Fant. He's like running routes, but it's like he's a, he's a good athlete, but it just feels so thin. We got a couple of guys down there. I think that that makes sense. So um, at that point, if most people are just going to go to Darren Waller, um, I'm probably going to try and pay down and see what I can do at running back with all those great running back plays we talked about. Yeah, I agree. Also, just one more name to throw out there, depending on uh, whether or not Jared Cook plays. They're playing against the Cardinals, and Josh Hill had a decent game last week. I believe he was like three for 43 in a touchdown. Arizona, obviously, is the friendliest team to tight ends in fantasy. So I think Josh Hill makes a little bit of sense uh, down there at around 32, um, 3,200. Just another name to kind of throw out there if you are looking to kind of diversify your lineups. Let's move over to defense. If we haven't had uh, Patriots in a while, huh? This, at least on a main slate for me. So this is like terrifying because I've just been like not playing these guys and getting just buried. But what do you think about it so far? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I so mean, they're the, most, they're the most expensive on the slate. It's really hard to fade them up to this point. But I saw uh, someone had a great tweet today showing that the quarterbacks that – um, what's his face that, that the Patriots defense has played so far and he just listed off like eight scrubs and then the next six or seven quarterbacks they face I don't really know where Baker even stands right now in terms of like you're not really scared to play him whatsoever especially not that Cleveland offensive line so they'll probably get a lot of pressure I'm very intrigued in this matchup I think that like you know maybe I'm wrong here but Cleveland is just seems like one of those teams where you know any given week you might get their best game right and they're capable of putting up those 30 points and Baker you know using that raw talent that we know he has kind of bottled up and letting that come out to surface but like I, I don't know I I don't think I would pay up for the Patriots just because it's the first I don't want to say legitimate offense they've played because the Browns aren't really, but they have a lot of star power on their offense and I think that gives them the capability of kind of going off uh, any given week you know yeah the range of outcomes for the Browns this year has been so wide like you said and it's been hard to project them too because they've been like either like just basically going all in on Chubb or they just like I don't know it's it's been crazy like they've they, I feel like they've been a hard one to peg on like what exactly they're going to do every week so I'm with you on yeah. that that said though I mean the Browns like one of the highest adjusted sack rates in the entire league like no quarterback has a higher interception rate than Baker right now um I don't know. I, I typically don't pay up, but I mean, in tournaments, I think that if you really wanted to, I think that they're, they're probably okay. Um, I, I think if you wanted to move down uh, to the Jaguars um, against this Jets team, um, just what, what Sam Darnold just put on display, like I'm sure that uh, the Jaguars are going to be owned, but uh, just talking about uh, interception rate, second highest um, among starters, at least second highest adjusted sack rate in the league from the Jets O line too. So um, I definitely think that um, just targeting home favorites is something that if you really just want to get simple about it, Jacksonville favored by six points at home. So I, th I think that they're they're probably okay as well. I think that um, New England is going to be pretty chalky even at that price. Um, 
I have a little bit of interest in uh, Tennessee against Tampa Bay and Jameis. Uh, they're only 3,200, so I think that they're, they're in play for sure. Um, it's kind of a tougher week at defense for me. I don't think there's like a clear standout option, which scares me even more because of the Patriots all the way up there. What do you think about Detroit um, playing against the Giants? They are at home. Uh, I think this is a game that's quietly going to feature a lot of passing, and Daniel Jones has been extremely turnover uh, friendly to defenses over the recent weeks. So Detroit's, I mean, they're a sneaky good defense, but like I said, they got rid of Quandre Diggs and a lot of people are not happy about that in the locker room. I still think that they have the um, chance to put a lot of pressure on, on, you know, Daniel Jones and really kind of rile him up because we've seen him go very, very much downhill after that first game. Yeah. I guess my concern would be just like on the slate, like Detroit's got the lowest pressure rate. Um, in general, I, I know that this Giants offensive line hasn't been great as Daniel Jones, like you said. Um, so I, I typically try and target these defensive lines that are at least pressuring a little bit more. Um, so I think that like on the whole kind of other end of the spectrum, one of the ones that I think is kind of interesting is Philly. Like say what you want about Philly's defense, but they have been getting pressure. Um, Josh Allen will take sacks, so he's not scared to push it downfield. So I, I think that Philly um, will kind of draw a little bit of interest. Again, New Orleans is a team that I'm almost always interested in because they pressure a ton. Um, against Kyler, another guy that'll take sacks. Um, there's going to be a, a decent amount of plays um, in, con- in comparison to most of these these Saints games. So I think I have some interest there. Um, Patriots, again, like one of the, the top pressure teams. I'm just trying to kind of go down the list here of the ones that I think uh, make some sense. I wish we would have a better – I think at some point we're going to be targeting Ryan Tannehill, though, just because how much he struggled um, with pressure. I just don't know if it's this week. So, yeah, tougher week at defense, I think. Yeah, a little, a little, uh, a little tough of a slate there for defense. I, I'm a huge fan of Houston this week as well as Indy in season long because you know just typically playing at home, they're favorites. They should dominate, and uh, both of the offenses that they're playing against are very one-dimensional. So I think that usually ends up getting you double-digit points or so. I know they're not typically great plays in terms of uh, DFS because it's going to be more of a, a lower over/under total, but I like those plays as well uh, I think that's all we got for today that was a good episode we hit you with the quarterback running back five receiver tight end defense everything we had in store for y'all so if you enjoyed the video make sure you smash that thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you are new we will be back next Saturday as always make sure you are following Joe on all of the social medias I will link that down in the description as always, and uh, Joe, thank you for joining us, my man. Good stuff, man. Thanks for having me. This is always one of the more fun shows to do this week or during the week. So I uh, appreciate you having me, my friend. All right, later.